So as we've been discussing Lopi Tall's rule, there's been a couple of indeterminate forms that we've investigated. We've talked about zero over zero and infinity over infinity, where Lopi Tall's rule applies directly. We've also talked about zero times infinity, which can be turned into one of these uh, quotient indeterminate forms for where Lopi Tall's rule applies. It turns out there are several other indeterminate forms. There are three indeterminate forms that we want to talk about in this video, which are of exponential type. They're going to look like zero to the zero, infinity to the zero, and one to the infinity. That is, we're going to be taking limits of the form, take the limit as x approaches a, of f of x to the g of x, where if we plugged a into f and into g, we'll get things like zero to the zero, infinity to the zero, and one to the infinity. And each and every one of these indeterminate forms are in fact indeterminate forms because there's a, there's a conflict of rules here, right? When you look at something like zero to the zero, well, when you take things to the zero power, like, you know, zero squared, that should be zero. If you like zero cubed, that should be zero. So powers of zero should be zero. But on the other hand, if I take like two to the zero, that's a one. You get three to the zero, that should be a one. Things to the zero power should be one. So there's this conflict, this clash of titans. Uh, who's more powerful, a base being zero or an exponent being zero? It turns out it's indeterminate because anything can happen. What about the next one? Infinity to the zero power. Well, if you take things like infinity squared, uh, that should be infinity. Infinity cubed, that should be infinity. But like we also mentioned, you know, things to the zero power should equal one. So who's more dominant? the base of infinity or the exponent of zero. Again, we get this clash of titans, these two powerful beasts fighting for dominance. And as such, turns out it could be anything. Uh, now this last one, uh, this last one is a lot harder for students to believe for some reason, but it's the same conflict as before. Sure, if you take things, if you take powers of one, like one squared, one cubed, one to the fourth, these are always equal to one. But what happens if you take things to the infinite power, two to the infinity? Uh, three to the infinity, four to the infinity, right? These are typically infinite, right? In which case, who's then more powerful? The base of one or the exponent of infinity, okay? There's that conflict there. And so who is, who's the winner? It could be anything. So we need to investigate these things to be more careful. Now, L'Hopital's rule only applies to forms zero over zero, infinity over infinity. Like this zero times infinity thing, we had to transform it into one of these quotient forms in order to apply L'Hopital's rule. We have to do the same thing with these exponentials. It's a little bit more tricky, but this is the general strategy. If you have an exponential expression, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the natural exponential and the log of, of the expression here. The reason we do that is because the exponential and the natural log are inverse operations. They cancel each other out, and so you get back f to the g. Now, the advantage here is if you take e to the natural log of f, of f of x to the g of x power is because looking at just this piece right here, the log of f to the g, by logarithmic properties, the exponent comes out in front, and this then becomes e, e to the g times natural log of f power. Now, if you take, for example, if f and g both go to zero, if f and g both go to zero here, then this thing looks like zero to the zero. This thing looks like e to the natural log of zero to the zero, but this thing right here is gonna look like e times zero times the natural log of zero, which the natural log of zero is essentially negative infinity. So you get e to the zero times infinity. Uh, and this is important because this is now an indeterminate form that we know how to compute. And therefore you can turn that into a product. And that's how we're gonna to proceed to compute these exponential indeterminate forms. They're a little bit more challenging because there's a lot of work going on here. So consider this one at present, the limit as x approaches zero, positive for x to the x. Well, if we just plug in zero, we're gonna get zero to the zero. This is an indeterminate form. So we have to investigate it a little bit more. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take e to the natural log of x to the x. This then becomes e to the x times the natural log of x. And we wanna take the limit of that. So this limit is equal to the limit as x approaches zero from the right of e to the x times the natural log of x. This is also another important step in this process here is that the exponential function is continuous. So we can actually bring the natural exponential out of this function and we get something like e to the limit of x times the natural log of x as x goes to zero. Um, sometimes because of the superscript notation, uh, it's a little bit more desirable to use, instead of e, you could say things like the function exp of x is equal to e to the x. Some people do that, 
uh, just so we can write it all in line. So this is exp of the limit as x, x times the natural log of x here as x goes to zero from the right. Because this has the form zero times infinity, we need to switch this into a quotient. And so we get exp of the limit of the natural log of x over one over one over x as x approaches zero. And so now you see that this is gonna have the indeterminate form infinity over infinity. Taking, now we can apply L'Hopital's rule, in which case we're gonna get that exp of the limit here as x approaches zero from the right. You're gonna get one over x over negative one over x squared when you take the derivatives. This fraction here is gonna simplify just to be negative x. So you're gonna get exp of the limit as x approaches zero from the right of just a negative x. So this is gonna turn out to be exp of zero, um, which exp remembers just e to the zero power. So we end up with just a one right here. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right of x to the x, that is equal to one. And so this then demonstrates exactly how we can compute these these exponential indeterminate forms. We had three of them, but the calculation of any one of them is really identical to the other ones. It doesn't make much of a difference which form you have, one to the infinity, zero to the zero, or infinity to the zero. The strategy is gonna be all the same. Let's take a look at another such example. Let's take the limit as x approaches zero from the right of one plus sine of four x uh, raised to the cotangent of x power. Notice that if we just plug in x equals zero, we're gonna get one plus sine of zero raised to the cotangent of zero power. Now sine of zero is zero, so that base is just gonna be one. Cotangent of zero is gonna turn out to be infinity. Mostly, basically we see that as you approach uh, cotangent from, excuse me, approach zero from the right, you find a vertical asymptote for cotangent. So this is gonna be one to the infinity. Is it one to the infinity or one to the negative infinity? Well, we can investigate whether that is, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the fact that cotangent has a vertical asymptote there is going to make the exponent go to the infinite, and thus that activates this indeterminate form. So what we need to then do is we need to compute the limit as x approaches zero from the right of e to the cotangent of x times the natural log of one plus sine of 4x power. That's the limit that we're going to have to compute next to go forward here. But again, as the e is continuous, we can just pull out that exponential function. So we get the limit as x approaches zero from the right of cotangent x times the natural log of one plus sine of four x. And we can go on from here, but like we saw in the previous example, the, the, nat the, the natural exponential e basically doesn't do anything until the very end of the problem. So some people just kind of discard it and just focus on the limit as x approaches zero of cotangent x times the natural log of one plus sine of four x. The idea is I'm just gonna compute this and I'll just remember to put, do the e at the end. But if you do that, you have to actually remember to do the e. It's a very common mistake to forget the e. So this function now has the form as x approaches zero cotangent's gonna to go to plus or minus infinity. We could figure out which direction it goes in, but again, the sine doesn't really matter here. And in this one, since sine is gonna to go to zero, you're gonna get the natural log of one, natural log of one is zero. This looks like infinity times zero. We need to make this into a quotient. The easiest way to make a quotient here, I think, is just to push cotangent to the denominator because cotangent has a very well-known reciprocal function. It's exactly just tangent. And we can take the derivative of tangent. That seems a lot easier uh, than pushing the natural log of one plus sine to the sine of 4x into the denominator. So this function now has the form, of course, that we're going to get what happens when we plug in x equals zero here, we're gonna get the natural log of one, which is zero over tangent of zero, which is zero itself. It looks like zero over zero. So L'Hopital's rule applies. And so we're gonna get the limit here as x approaches zero. We're gonna take the derivative of the natural log of one plus sine over four x. That looks like, well, since it's a natural log, you're gonna get one plus sine of four x in the denominator. Then the inner derivative goes on top. We're gonna to get four cosine of four x, and in the denominator, when we take the derivative of c, uh, excuse me, of tangent, we're going to get a secant squared. Got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, so that fraction is a little bit messed up. Let's simplify it. We're going to get four cosine of four x over one plus sine of four x. Since we are dividing by a secant squared, that actually puts a secant squared on top. But since secant itself is just a cos one over cosine, I'm going to put that in the denominator. 
So we end up with cosine squared of x, like so. Taking the limit as x approaches 0. Now let's see what happens if we plug in x equals 0. We would end up with a 4 times cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, should be mentioned. Then you're going to get 1 plus sine of 0. We've already observed that sine of 0 is 0. And then you get cosine of 0, which is itself 1. So we should get 4 times 1 over 1 times 1. This is going to be 4. Now we might get so excited that we computed the limit, we have to remember the answer is not four. The answer, we act to find the answer, we actually have to go back up to the white space above here, right? Because we're we found out this limit is equal to e to the fourth. That is the correct limit. That's honestly, in my opinion, the most dangerous part of these exponential indeterminate forms. We get so excited that we computed a limit, we have to remember that the answer is going to be e to that number. Don't forget the natural exponential there. Uh, e to the fourth is the correct limit calculation. Let's do one last example. Let's compute the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 3 over x to the x power. Notice what happens if we just plug in uh, infinity. We get 1 plus 3 over infinity raised to the infinite power. This likewise looks like 1 to the infinity. So what we're going to do is we need to compute the limit here as x approaches infinity of x times the natural log of 1 plus 3 over x. So notice what I did there is I brought down the exponent and slapped in a natural log to calculate this thing. This function has the form infinity times the natural log of 1, which is 0 times infinity. That's always going to happen with these exponentials. You go from an exponential to a product. Then we have to switch that into a quotient in determinant form. So I'm going to do that by pushing the x in the denominator. Take the limit as x approaches infinity of the natural log of 1 plus 3 over x and over 1 over x. You rarely, if ever, put the natural log in the denominator here. So now this function has the indeterminate form. You'll notice the numerator will still look like the natural log of 1, which is a 0. The denominator is going to look like 1 over infinity, which is the same thing as 0. So we have an indeterminate form that L'Hopital's rule applies. So by L'Hopital's rule, we're going to take the derivative top and bottom. The derivative of the numerator, well, when it comes to derivatives of a natural log, you always just put the original operand on the bottom. Then you have to take the derivative of the inner function. That goes on top. So you're going to get a negative 3 over x squared. In the denominator, we take the derivative of 1 over x, which is going to be negative 1 over x squared. There is so much going on here. Again, so many fractions. Uh, since I'm dividing by a fraction, I'm just going to write this as, you know, multiplying by the reciprocal. I think that will be an easy way to clean this thing up. So we take the limit as x approaches infinity, we get negative 3 over x squared over 1 plus 3 over x. And then you're going to times this by the reciprocal, um, which is going to be x squared over negative 1. We still have a bunch of nested fractions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times x squared over x squared right here so that these guys cancel out. And then you can distribute. It looks like a 3, doesn't it? Let me make that look like a 2. And so then we're going to distribute this thing through. What does this thing turn out to be? Take the limit. Again, a lot of, a lot of mess here. But we, we, we multiply it through. So in the numerator, we're going to have a negative 3x squared. These x squareds cancel, so we still have the negative 3 and the x squared. In the denominator, when we distribute that negative x squared through, we're going to get a negative x and a, excuse me, negative x squared, when you times it by the 1, and then we're going to get a negative 3x, like so. Um, what would happen here if we plug in x equals infinity? We'd still get in infinite, right? But in the case, we're going to get infinity over infinity. That's exactly what I meant here. We could do L'Hopital's rule again, uh, but I'll notice that the top is a, this is a rational function. We have a negative 3x squared on top. We have a negative x squared on the bottom. Since this is a balanced rational function, as x goes to infinity, this thing is going to turn out to be negative 3 over negative 1. We end up with just a 3. So there's other ways of calculating this thing, but I'm going to be, I, I'm going to be content with that simplification going forward here. And this then doesn't give us the final answer, right? Our, this, this limit we did in yellow, this is not equal to the original thing. Uh, in fact, what we have coming in over here, that's a long equal sign right there. What we get is that the limit is going to equal e to this number, e cubed. And so the final limit is going to be e cubed. Don't forget that e at the end, because like we saw in the previous examples, this stuff in yellow is just sort of scratch work to help us figure out this limit. This limit is equal to 3, but this limit's not equal to the original limit. Well, the original limit will equal to this limit 
uh, raised by the base e.